So uh, thank you so much for joining us this evening, Peter. Um, I know which, which part of the UK you're in to sit tonight, but uh, we really appreciate you taking the time out to join us in the IDFOC for this uh, conversation. It might have been a fireside chat in, in different uh, circumstances, but um, you know, I'd like to dive into uh, some of the insights you have uh, over the years uh, in a, some very topical uh, subjects. Um, and particularly uh, the book, um, you can't see it here, it's not coming up on the screen, Democracy for Sale that you published very recently. And um, in, in the book, uh, you're introduced as Peter Gagan, an Irish writer, broadcaster, and investigations editor at the award-winning news website, Open Democracy. You led Open Democracy's investigations into dark money in British politics that were nominated for a 2019 British Journalism Award and the Paul Foot Award. Your journalism has appeared in the New York Times, The Guardian, The London Review of Books and many other publications. I should add the Irish Times as well. <laughs> um, your last book, The People's Referendum, Why Scotland Will Never Be the Same Again, was nominated for the Saltire First Book Award. And this book um, has uh, already won um, was it the book of the month or what was the award, Peter? Oh, it was Book of the Week in the Observer. Yeah, it's not quite book a book, but yeah, Observer. I'll take it though. I'll but, take it. But, yeah, okay. But Peter, there's a lot more to you uh, than just what uh, the introduction to the book here. And um, for the audience here, many of whom um, aren't familiar with you or your work, um, I think it's worth uh, spending a little, uh, taking a few minutes out to you know, talk a little bit about you and, and your background and um, your, your interest um, growing up, you know, in Longford 20 plus years ago. And um, you will you will know that many of the audience here are serving or former army officers, Irish army officers. And, um, you know, you uh, um, may not be very familiar with you, but that you, you would certainly know a lot about uh, the scene here, the border, the north, the Good Friday Agreement as well as what's going on in the UK. So perhaps you, you, you'd um, fill us in a bit on, on your background. Well, yeah, as you say, I'm from lovely Longford, Longford Town, and uh, I grew up in Longford Town. I went to, to school in Longford Town. And I guess I quite, I may as well kind of tell you about my route into journalism, because it'll tell you a little bit about me. I actually got into journalism at quite a young age. When I was about 14 or 15, I used to produce kind of uh, free fanzines. If, if you, you might have had those in your day too, where you'd photocopy. I'd write things and photocopy them and give them out around the school. So that was my first publication. I was the editor, I was the sub-editor, and then I was the journalist as well, and my first uh, fanzine when I was in school. And, and then I, I ended up, um, obviously, and did things like worked in, in college newspapers and universities. But I actually spent a long time in university. I ended up uh, studying in Ireland, but then studying in New York, and ended up doing a PhD in Edinburgh University, which is kind of looking at post-Good Friday Agreement in Northern Ireland, which is... The Good Friday Agreement seems to be a topical issue again, far more topical probably than it was when I finished my PhD some 12 years ago. And when I was doing my PhD, I used to freelance a lot, I used to write a lot about lots of things, politics and the arts and lots of other things. And after I finished my PhD, I moved to Belfast to work for the University of Ulster for a little while as um, a research associate on what was a kind of, if people remember things called Peace 2, there was a series of peace funding given by the European Union to Northern Ireland. It was Peace 1, we're up to Peace 4 now, I think. And this was kind of 2008, this was yeah, 2008 and pre-financial crash and there was still quite a lot of money in that, in, you know, it was kind of little cottage industry in, in peace building. And I was working in Derry on uh, the interface between the fountain, if anybody knows Derry, which is a small loyalist housing estate on the city side of Derry, and Bishop Street, which is a kind of large, much predominantly nationalist area. And I was kind of trying to help people there. Kind of a very difficult, thankless job in many respects, I have to be honest. But while I was doing that, I was continually freelancing as well, doing a lot of writing. And when my contract ended at the University of Ulster, I was offered a job as a journalist by a small arts website in Northern Ireland, which doesn't exist anymore, that was funded by the Arts Council. Uh, and I kind of took that job and, and I've been working as a journalist ever since. I actually ended up working for, I was trained by Channel 4 in investigations. I used to make, I got onto the Channel 4 dispatches training scheme a few years after, after kind of moving into journalism, which was a kind of training scheme for investigations in television. And that kind of got me into doing a lot of investigative journalism. So I, my work in the last few years, which the book kind of culminates and it's looked a lot at the kind of role of money and lobbying and influence in British politics. So I work primarily for Open Democracy, which is a kind of 
news kind of website based in uh, based in London, but we do a lot of work kind of internationally. Um, and and actually, in full disclosure of my own funding, actually most of my work is funding by subscribers, but also I am grant funded by an organisation called Illuminate, which was set up by Pierre Omidyar, who's the man who made eBay. Um, and this is actually kind of an interesting change in journalism, where there's a lot more kind of philanthropic journalism going going on. And so a lot of my work these days is much more investigative. It's mainly online and print and I collaborate a lot with other news organizations as well so for example during the summer we had a long-running series of investigations with Guardian and work with lots of other journalists across other platforms as well and at the moment as I say a lot of my, my work focuses on, on power and money and politics and also online I look a lot at the kind of rise of disinformation and misinformation so I've had quite a varied uh, career I, I worked in Scotland for many years I'm talking to you actually at the moment from my house in Glasgow uh, my previous work I was on the Scottish referendum and yeah I've kind of managed to I think at times over the last few years be in some interesting places uh, to kind of chart the changing kind of nature of Britain but also internationally I covered the Trump campaign in 2016 I, I was in Egypt in 2011 not long after Mubarak fell and I've been lucky enough to, to work around the world at different times as well as a journalist. Great and um, I, I can't remember when I first started following you on Twitter but I do remember um, about this time last year, or maybe slightly earlier in the summer, seeing photographs of beautiful scenery around Fermanagh. And um, little did I know that uh, actually you were you were uh, working away there on, on this book, and uh, which is a segue, I guess, into the book Democracy for Sale. Um, and uh, perhaps you might, because um, there's a very interesting Irish angle to this. What prompted you to write this book and what alert you know what brought you into uh, this whole issue of um, dark money and uh, dirty politics in, in the UK well in some ways no one is surprised as I've written a book about dark money and dirty politics in the UK as I am to be honest and um, if you told me a few years ago when I started off I, I would I was very surprised but it wasn't an issue that I was all that familiar with kind of money and politics wasn't something I'd worked all that much on but it kind of goes back actually to just before the Brexit referendum in late June uh, 2016. Um, and I was actually working at the time, I just finished on uh, dispatches for Channel 4 and I was working as a, a jobbing journalist for the Irish Times who I've often worked for over the years and I've always enjoyed it. And I was working on their Brexit referendum coverage and Mark Kennessy at the Irish Times news desk sent me to Sunderland uh, very propitiously as, as, as chance would have it just a few days before the Brexit referendum. And I'm sure, you know, people on this call remember after the referendum, a lot of people were talking about Sunderland because it was the first place to declare on the night and it declared heavily for Brexit. And it kind of became this bellwether for the, for the referendum itself and the referendum result. And it's a kind of post-industrial city. It's had a hard time up in the northeast of England. And so I went there a few days before the referendum to do that thing that you do as a, as a reporter. You go to somewhere for a big event and you kind of write those pieces you talk to people on the street and you write something about it and some journalists hate doing that i discovered but i really enjoyed it i really like my previous book on scotland was really all about that i really enjoyed going around the place and meeting people and you know off my investigations start from things like that so i find it's a great you know I, i'm always a keen believer in trying to get out but anyway i was standing on a train station platform in Sunderland just as i was leaving and i noticed a copy of the metro the free newspaper and it had a big advert on it and it just said like take back control which is the, the leave campaign slogan there's this big wraparound advert so i picked it up and i kind of turned it around and i noticed i was just waiting for the train and i noticed on the back there was the lion head logo of the dup the democratic unionist party and little imprint that said this advert was paid for by the dup and i thought that's very curious what's it you know dup are not known for slash cash Where are the dup doing an expensive advert in Sunderland on the newspaper. How odd. And um, I did a couple of things journalists do now these days, even in 2016. You know, I took a picture of it, sent a tweet, and then I just kind of forgot about it. I stuffed it in my bag. I, I, I had a copy to file for the next day's paper. My, my deadline was coming. So I kind of, the, the weeks and months that followed, especially after the Brexit result, I kind of found myself thinking about this because I had worked, as I say, as a journalist in Belfast, and I was aware of something. I didn't know all that much about money and politics, but I did know something interesting about Northern Irish electoral law. I knew that donations in Northern Ireland were secret. And it had been something that I'd, I'd known for years and I'd always wanted to write about it, but I never had because journalistically a loophole isn't, isn't that interesting, but somebody using and abusing a loophole is very interesting. So just reporting about the existence of the loophole wasn't that interesting, but I knew it existed. So I think, well, maybe somebody funneled money to the DUP for the, pay for this Brexit referendum. 
And in early 2017, Adam Ramsey, who's a journalist at Open Democracy, uh, got in touch with me and he said, I, I, he'd seen my tweet and he said, I heard, see you're interested in the Brexit uh, referendum of the DUP. And he'd been in Edinburgh in the run-up to the referendum a few days beforehand, before the vote, and he'd seen lots of vote leave posters and placards, which all had the same imprint as well, paid for by the DUP. So two of us said, look, this is interesting, let's try and do something together. So we stuck our heads together and we started doing things like trying to figure out, you know, how, where this newspaper had been. We realised it had been all over the UK, so the ads are all over Britain, because actually the Metro doesn't circulate in Northern Ireland, funnily enough. Um, mm. It had been all over, uh, all over GB. We were able to see that they'd been buying Facebook adverts because people had posted like Facebook adverts. And we were able to work out that the DUP had spent, um, well, at least a quarter of a million pounds. We now know it was almost half a million pounds on their Brexit referendum, which was a huge sum of money for Northern Irish politics. You know, the DUP in winning the Stormont election in 2016, which was about six weeks before the Brexit referendum, had spent about 50 grand. So this was, this was a big outlay. And we published that story, and we published it at a very important moment. And I, I kind of knew it was an important moment, but I didn't really realize just how important it was. That, it, some people might remember the Stormont Assembly collapsed for a good for a few years after the cash rash scandal, the renewable heating incentive scandal. Yeah. So there was a lot of pressure on the DUP and money. A lot of people asking about what was the DUP doing with money. You know, DUP's financial affairs were starting to come under the spotlight. We published this story about two weeks before the snap vote. And it kind of went big in Northern Ireland. It, I was on television quite a lot. It was raised in a series of debates before the storm poll. And the DUP, even though donations were secret, the DUP was under pressure to kind of cough up a name, basically, to say where this money was coming from because there was a lot of uh, suggestions that could be coming from Russia or anywhere else. And they said, look, this money has come from a group called the Constitutional Research Council, which sounds really grand. It sounds like a great big August organization that does really important research, you know, rooms filled with kind of wonks and people who, with glasses like mine doing lots of research. Actually, it's nothing of the sort. It's a kind of legal fiction, really. It's called, it's called in British Electoral Law Association which again sounds grand, but basically it's, it's, it's a body that has no legal standing. It doesn't have, have to file company accounts, doesn't have to list its members, doesn't have a website or anything like that. And the Constitutional Research Council really only ever done two things. Um, it gave money to the DUP and it gave money to the European Research Group of kind of Brexit supporting Tory MPs. And it was run by a man called Richard Cook, who was a kind of serial failed Scottish Conservative candidate, ironically not very far away from where I am now on the south side of Glasgow. And, um, Myself and Adam then started burrowing into Mr. Cook and discovered all sorts of fantastical things. I described my novel, it's a bit like an airport thriller. You think that this man's going to be really dull and it turns out he's done things like going to business with the former head of Saudi intelligence and been shipping waste internationally and signed $80 million contracts for railway sleepers in Ukraine, all from his office in Glasgow. It's very, very strange. I, I couldn't even do it all justice here. I think that is one bit you'd have to read in the book to really get a sense of how strange it is. But at the end of all that, I found myself going, wow, if this is how one donation works, like how does it work more generally? Like what else is going on in British politics? Is like, is a one-off, is this strange, huge donation at the crucial time in the Brexit referendum, just a one-off thing? Or is it much deeper? So I found myself doing lots more investigations, initially into things like the spending of the Brexit referendum, but then much more generally into party funding, lobbying, influ influence peddling, online, you know, the whole online world. So it kind of opened up a bit of a Pandora's box and uh, I think in some ways, because it was an area I hadn't done all that much work in before, I was probably quite well placed to kind of start to go, this is really strange, and uh, start to ask a lot of questions. Yeah, so, um, Peter, are you still with us, Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But there was also another angle, wasn't there? I mean, it wasn't just the advertising through Metro um, or the on street um, stuff in, in, in Edinburgh. There's also, Bills paid for uh, aggregate um, IQ in uh, Canada, right? Yeah, that's another curious aspect of this case, is that um, the DUP, again, they're not a party prone to spending huge amounts of money, despite decided to spend over £30,000 with a data analytics firm that was based above an optician's in a shopping centre in Victoria, the small city of Victoria in British Columbia which is also a very, very long way from Belfast. And just by chance, Vote Leave, Dominic Cummings' campaign, spent over £3 million with the same company. And this company's quite an interesting company because it really was almost like a shell company. It had almost no staff. And it was connected to Cambridge Analytica, the two companies. They weren't the exact same, but they had a lot of connections between each other. and been, They'd been in business together. There'd been staff overlap between the two of them. And what was particularly interesting with, with this was that the DUP really, you know, 
the DUP didn't actually have this money was kind of spent on behalf of the DUP rather than the DUP actually been given the money and the DUP spending it. A lot of the money was transferred directly on the DUP's behalf in the same way that actually the advertisement in the Metro wasn't booked by the DUP, it was booked by Mr. Richard Cook. So there's lots of suggestions here. And in British electoral law, if you do that, if you campaign together, and, and I guess I should have said this, one of the reasons this matters is during the Brexit referendum, there was a ceiling in the amount of money you could spend. There's only so much money you can spend in the referendum. And one of the reasons a lot of these this money started getting spent by not just the DUP, but other kind of small, strange campaign groups on the Leave side was that the Boat Leave campaign, Dominic Cummings campaign, had basically run out of spending room. Money was coming in the door, but it couldn't spend it anymore. So it needed ways of spending it. And there's a strong suspicion, which I talk about in my book, that what had happened really was this exactly, that the Leave campaign had run out of spending room and started funding money to the DUP. We would know more about this if the Electoral Commission had investigated it, but the Electoral Commission decided not to investigate it because, and this is, I found this from internal documents from the Electoral Commission that they had to release some of the Freedom of Information, that the Electoral Commission had basically looked at this, said this all looks a bit dodgy, but because they'd already find vote leave, they'd already find Dominic Cummings' campaign vote leave for breaking the law during the referendum, they decided we won't really bother looking into this too. And you think at that stage, and okay, they find the vote leave campaign, that must be a big deal. You know, in America, Michael Cohen went to prison for breaking electoral law. But in Britain, the maximum fine for breaking electoral law is just £20,000. And if anyone looks at the news these days, breaking electoral law hasn't done Dominic Cummings any harm whatsoever. Or if it has, or if he has any sleepless nights about it, he's not showing it at the moment. No. I mean, I think in the book you say it's uh, basically a cost of being in business these days, isn't it? To pay the fine. Um, yeah. 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 Now, I know, um, I mean, the, there was, you, you mentioned about the controversy in the North, um, and you were talking about the Electoral, uh, electoral Commission, there. that was the one in, in Britain, right? But the Electoral Commission in the North got involved too, did they, or was that just... Well, the, the Electoral Commission in the North is, is so it's, it is interesting. So in, in, in Britain, like the North slightly, unsurprisingly, is a bit of a place apart, even when it comes to elections. Uh, so what you have is... So what did happen on the back of this, so what's interesting as well about the DUP donation as well, I should say, is that when the donation was made, political donations in Northern Ireland were kept secret. And while I said that you're going to you, maximum fine is £20,000, anyone revealing information about a political donation in Northern Ireland could get six months in prison. And I had quite interesting conversations where I go to the, I go to the cafe with people from the Northern Irish Electoral Commission and they'd be really tight-lipped, and I'd try and do that, that kind of Woodward and Bernstein thing of saying, if I just say this, would you nod? And they'd just start laughing, because you're trying to get something out of them. Um, but what was, um, but what was in what's interesting about it is, though, actually, in British law, there was a provision. So what happened in 2014 was Naomi Long, who was, who was uh, the Alliance MP for, North, for East Belfast, when she took Peter Robinson's seat, very surprisingly, in 2010. She took Peter Robinson's seat and she was in the coalition government because the Alliance Party's sister party is the Liberal Democrats. And one of the things she managed to get on the statute books in Britain was an end to donor secrecy in Northern Ireland. So every political party in Northern Ireland from the start of 2014 had to register all their donations as if they were in the rest of the United Kingdom. The only difference was they weren't published. And the provision within this law was that at any time the Secretary of State could, literally just with a drop of a hat, publish all political donations from the start of 2014 on. The Northern Ireland Electoral Commission wanted this to happen for ages. And when this story broke about the DUP donation, they were basically saying, please let us publish this. Please, please, please can we publish this. And you might remember that shortly after this, so in March 2017, the DUP got a real kicking in the polls. They lost, I think they lost yeah. eight seats in the assembly. They went down to 30. They were just about the biggest party. Sinn Féin yeah. were very close. And it was a disaster for the DUP. Um, and then... A few, couple of months later, though, everything was turned around when there was a general, another snap election turned the DUP's favours around again because it was a snap general election and Theresa May lost her majority and lo and behold was reliant on the DUP. At this stage, the issue of political donations in Northern Ireland had become a real hot button topic. This story had gone big and Labour were on top of it and it was quite clear that this had to change. All the political parties in Northern Ireland, except for the DUP, were quite you know, saying we want, we want an end to this. And I, re I reported in some length in my book, what happened was the Northern Ireland Affairs Committee decided they were going to um, bring in an end to donor secrecy, join with Brokenshire, the um, kind of hilariously then named uh, Tory um, Secretary of State for Northern Ireland said we're going to do this. 
But instead of bringing it in from 2014, as was the easiest thing to do, they decided to bring it in from June of 2017, conveniently not catching that DUP donation. And the Northern Ireland uh, Select Committee had a meeting um, in Portcullis House in Westminster in like late 2017, in a dusty room in Portcullis House. And it was nine, nine Tories, eight Labour, and they had a debate about it. And I quote some of the book, and it's, it's, it is quite interesting. Labour were really going after them on it. Uh, Ian Paisley Jr. and Sammy Wilson had turned up from DUP as kind of unusual and uh, irregular attendees as well. And kind of were, you can, the transcripts from Hansard of them kind of shouting every so often over some of it. And at the end of it, though, they voted along party lines and Northern Ireland got done uh, transparency, but we never found out what happened to the DUP nation. So that's going back, but going forward now, um, it, it will be all transparent. Um, it is all transparent, but the problem yeah. actually for Northern Ireland is that the, the, the uh, ceilings are too high. Yeah. So like I, the ceilings for political donations for the parties are £7,500 to GB, which is uh, it's a bit, probably too high for GB. It's way too high for Northern Ireland. Like £7,500 in Northern Ireland is a lot of money. Uh, yeah. Not just because the cost of living is cheaper, which it is, but also just it's a smaller place. You'd buy a lot of access for £7,500. Sure, and so yeah. it's really it hasn't really worked it's been you know although ian pacey jr was this week um fined by the electoral commission and forced to return money that he got from two local councils when they bought seats at a dup dinner that was yeah. removed to be an inadmissible donation so every so often it catches somebody but there hasn't been much transparency although i think that's peter gentleman's been caught a few times now hasn't yes he's had a few <laughs> he's had a few with the authorities over the last while indeed yes <laughs> So, he's, no, uh, but, he's no stranger to it. No, but um, and, uh, even this week, I think uh, it's been apparent that for some time uh, there's a bit of a split in the DUP, isn't there, between those who are based in Northern Ireland and the Assembly and those who are in Westminster. And uh, so you mentioned uh, Sammy Wilson, uh, Ian Paisley, and Gregory Campbell, I think, was the treasurer at the time of that. Ticker donation. Yeah, Jeffrey Donaldson led the campaign. Jeffrey's also an MP. Yeah, 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 and, yeah, and, yeah. And, yeah. And you can see it this week still, actually. There's, and what's the great irony of the Brexit referendum and the DUP support for? So you're breaking was, up a little bit, yeah, Peter. My thesis, speaking to one or two people inside the party, is that I'll be speaking. With, oh, wow, my, can you? Is that, Sorry, I, I think the connection isn't so good right now. Yeah. Okay, can you hear me, Peter? Is that, is that better? That's better, yeah. That's Have better. We got Sorry, but we... Yep, mm. yeah. Oh, yeah but we sense. missed what you were saying there, yeah. Oh, yeah. So I was just saying about the DUP, I think the DUP internally didn't think that much about the Brexit referendum. They were focused no. on taking government in, in Northern Ireland in 2016. And they thought that they could just give it to the, you know, the kind of recalcitrant MPs because what the DUP has done is always treated Westminster like the place to send the people that are a bit of a pain in the ass, to be honest with you. Like yeah. Sammy Wilson is the man who says, you know, every time he opens his mouth, there's a news line for journalists like me. He's no use to a party like the DUP, which at the end of the day actually, you know, wants to be a party of government. And, I think there's what happened was they outsourced and then the tail ended up wagging the dog because the people in Westminster, you had two years where there was no assembly in Northern Ireland and Arlene Foster was the first minister of something that didn't exist. Whereas and the DUP MPs in Westminster thought that they were all powerful and would be forever. And so that's how we ended up, I think, in many ways in some of the wrecks of morass that we had over the last two years. Yeah. But uh, what, what's interesting to me, um, there are the ties between particularly the, the Westminster uh, wing of the DUP and you know some of these um, organizations in the UK in 55 Tufton Street um, the think tanks that have been going for many years now um, and really were the seedbed for a lot of what's happening today the Brexit even prior to Brexit uh, campaigning against joining the euro um, con con campaigning against alternative vote um, you know there was a series of, of uh, occasions where all these groups were, were working um, a particular way and, and certain names and going through the thread and maybe we'll talk about that a few minutes before we circle back to the, to the situation in the north. Yeah it's one of the things I try and explore in my book in a bit of detail is, is to try and ask the question you know like okay what happened was you know I understood how the Brexit referendum had been paid for and had been funded and all that sort of stuff and I kind of wanted to understand about 
you know, where had this, where, like, where almost was the, the intellectual story of this coming from? Like, what was the history of this? And how, uh, how had the case for leaving the European Union like, come to become this kind of a major plank of the Conservative Party's policy? And it's really interesting when you go back and understand it, because, you know, if you look at the referendum, you think there was just like kind of Nigel Farage and UKIP. And, and UKIP were an important force in terms of, of party politics and forcing David Cameron to accept the referendum. But at the same time, what was going on with the Conservative Party was you had this kind of right wing fringe of the Conservative Party, kind of very Thatcherite fringe, libertarian, very closely related to these kind of same groups that are in the United States. And they were mobilizing and kind of making the case around this and trying to like kind of stealthily influence British politics for, for decades, really. Um, and I, in the book, I go into the kind of history of the European Research Group, which is a very interesting kind of example of this. You might have heard of some, some people on the call might have heard of them. They became quite famous in the last couple of years as this kind of hardline Brexit group. But for a long time, this was just a kind of backbench talking shop of conservatives. And what it, but it was a place in which conservatives could get together and could kind of plan and plot about Brexit and, and Euroscepticism. And then after the referendum, because it already existed, it became an amazing way for conservative Brexiters to put a huge amount of pressure on their own government. So you just kind of surreal sense where you would have people appearing on television as spokespeople for different issues in the European Research Group. But the other thing I was really interested in when I started researching this um, book and started writing a lot, and this was kind of in 2017, 18, was I became very aware that both in the media, but also amongst politicians, small think tanks, small like kind of groups, research institutes were really, really important. They were being cited all the time. They were appearing on the television all the time. And in particular, they were providing kind of alternative arguments around Brexit. And when I started looking at these think tanks, groups like the Institute of Economic Affairs, the Adam Smith Institute, Policy Exchange, the Center for Policy Studies, they all sound very august. They all sound very serious. They all sound very intellectual. But actually, most of these are anonymously funded institutes who are funded by corporate donors. And a lot of what they produce is basically depending on who's paying them money to do it. So they get money from the tobacco industry, the gambling industry, the oil industry, things like that. But a long time for a lot of these groups, Brexit was their big campaign, was their big issues. And, you know, if you look at it, like even last week, the Adam Smith Institute, which again sounds like a very august institution, it, when it put out a statement on the internal markets bill, which you might imagine might talk about free trade and Adam Smith, but no, it actually talks about how the government mustn't cow talk to Scottish nationalists and Welsh nationalists. And that's the language it uses. Well, you can see that these are less kind of academic bodies and more kind of pressure groups and very partisan ones at that. And what was really interesting is once I started looking and treading through some of the individuals and the characters, people like Dominic Cummings, people like Daniel Hannan, who've been around for 20 years, the Brexit referendum didn't just come out of the air and the people who won it didn't just come out of thin air either. They'd actually a long time. You mentioned the alternative vote there. There's a referendum on the alternative vote back in 2011. And that was kind of referendum that passed off in Britain with not much remark, alternative vote won, uh, lost, it didn't happen, the no campaign won. How it happened, didn't, no one really thought that much about. But actually what had happened was it was run by the same people who ran the Leave campaign in 2016 and they used the same tactics. They talked about how the new alternative vote would cost 250 million. They put up pictures of babies in incubators and said, you know, we could spend this money on hospitals instead you know, the kind of scare tactics, you did a lot of money, a lot of corporate money. They really pushed much harder than the, the, the pro AV campaign. And it was a really interesting test case. So I started trying to understand a lot of these things. And it's particularly interesting looking at the British government now, even more so than when I wrote the book. A lot of people who are, you know, around the cabinet table now, Dominic Brab, Prishi Patel, Matt Hancock, many of those, a lot of these are, are almost graduates of the Institute of Economic Affairs, are very close to them. Um, and yeah. you might remember a couple of weeks ago, Matt Hancock said he, they were going to abolish Public Health England. That yeah. announcement was made a policy exchange, an anonymously funded think tank. And it was a policy that a lot of these think tanks have been pushing since the start of this year. Since the, pand since the pandemic started, they've been saying that the problem is Public Health England. So these think tanks actually have probably more influence now than they ever did. But, and what's also amazing about them is how far in Britain a small amount of money goes. The turnover of these institutions is very small, one and a half, two million pounds a year, not big books really. You know, probably a quick, a open democracy's turnover is about the same as one of these think tanks. But they're very, very, very good at access to politicians, getting into the media, 
In 2015, the Institute of Economic Affairs estimated that while its turnover is £2 million, pounds, it got £66 million pounds worth of media coverage. So you yeah, can see right. if you're somebody who wants to influence politics, it's a much better idea to just give that money to a think tank. So these think tanks, um, Peter, uh, seem to me to have two things in common. One is um, the funding, okay? And it would appear a lot of it comes from these libertarian, uh, a lot of it is coming from billionaires, uh, you know, household names like the Mercers, the Koch brothers. The DeVos from Amway, uh, firstly. And secondly, the, the, the common thread through a lot of them is deregulation. And even doing away with, you know, as you, the, the, the announcement that was made last week about public health England, you know, it's, it's, it's all about taking away, stripping away um, state involvement, right? Yeah, that's a unifying theme across a lot of these funders. You know, what, so what, basically what happened was in America, from the kind of late 60s on, you had this huge amount of libertarian money went into politics. And what happened was people like the Koch brothers, Dark Money by Jane Meyer, which is a fantastic book. She's a New Yorker writer. My book is, I'd cite her book at the start of mine. It's very much inspired by her great work. And she charted this. And what happened was, very cleverly, these, these guys like David Koch went, rather than giving lots of money to politicians who might not even do what we want them to do, why don't we buy the idea space? So instead of giving money to politicians and lobbying for a tax break, if you buy research institutes, you buy universities, you buy thinkers in the public realm to make low tax in that instance or, or deregulation the norm, the policy issue, it's a much more successful way of doing things than trying to just lobby politicians and individual politicians. In it. Because, you know, politicians often don't, they're not you know, for a lot of reasons, they're not full of policy ideas. So there, if you can come along with an off-the-shelf policy idea into a vacuum, you, you have a much better chance of, of success. And that's what happened really in, in American politics from the 70s on, and something similar happened in Britain. And it's continued on in America. And, and in, what's so fascinating about Britain, and I think that's why it's so interesting to understand why Britain has moved so quickly in the last few years, is that this was going on in America at the same time. Britain looked kind of different. It had labor, okay, there was the Iraq war, but it, it was quite, you know, status in many respects. But underneath, when there was a real policy vacuum, these guys were still going. And when, especially when Cameron got into power, those five years of the coalition government were really important because the Tories were in power, but they weren't really in power, a lot of their MPs, because especially the right-wing MPs were nowhere near power. And they were really pissed off, to be honest with you. They had no chance of getting near the ministerial position. The, the Liberal Democrats, you know, they, they were nobodies. Cameron didn't want them. Cameron had no time for this politics. And so they became increasingly agitated. So they, what you ended up with was a really kind of a development of what you almost see as a new right. People like Dominic Raab and Prishi Patel. It's incredible that Prishi Patel is the Home Secretary now. Five yeah. years ago, oh. she was one of those MPs that was just quoted as a random lunatic. You know, in news stories, there's a kind of, would you believe that an MP said this? And in that way, where British politics is always kind of allowed, because you've got so many MPs, you'd have a lot of backbench MPs who, like Priti Patel, you would expect would never have any expectation of government. But what I try and do in the book as well is to kind of where I can to show how these people have this really long lineage. So, for example, Priti Patel was a press officer for James Goldsmith's referendum party back in the mid-90s. Yeah. And that was a huge, the referendum party was a seminal thing. And I think it's one of those things, even a lot of political people in Britain wouldn't know. And I tried in this book, to, you know, as much as I can, without going overboard with it, but to try and give a sense of actually the intellectual lineage of these people, that they didn't just appear out of nowhere, fully formed in 2016. No, and, um, you know, one of the interesting things today is, we say the people who were in the vanguard of Brexit are around the time of the referendum, the David Davis, Dean Fox, uh, even Jeffrey Cox, they've all been pushed out. And, and now we have a new generation who, um, you know, wrote these books together. I uh, can't remember the name of the book now that Dominic Rabin and Pretty Patel. And, oh, yeah, uh, Britannia Unchained. Yeah, and, you know, so and that's going back a few years. Um, mm -hmm. And how they, they've come through and taken over. You talk about the party within the party, you know, Steve Baker and the organization. Um, just uh, phenomenal. Um, but, um, I suppose one of the, uh, just what I want to move on back to the, to the North, but um, because uh, really where I want to go with all of this, Peter, is to talk about the potential for a border poll, okay? And, you know, your insight in the GFA, the Good Friday Agreement, and how the referendum was run in Scotland. And, you know, in Ireland now, in the Republic, we have referendum regularly. And there's never a question about how it's run, uh, what the rules are around running a referendum. But 
what we see in the UK is that it's, it's all made up, right, as we go along. There's no, there are no firm and fast rules. Let me talk a little bit about the, the Scottish referendum. I know that was another book you wrote, The, People, well, the People's Referendum, Why Scotland mm. Will Never Be the Same Again. Um, I haven't read the book, but you might uh, just talk a little bit about the lessons um, around the Scottish referendum, and then we, we can, particularly as we pertain, if there is to be a border poll. Well, it's interesting almost because I think it's like the Scottish referendum in 2014. If you read my book now, I think it's quite, an, it's, it's probably, it was written just after the referendum. And in some ways, it's probably quite optimistic. And it's far more optimistic a book than I would write now. And what's quite interesting, I think, about that referendum was that, like, it wasn't that it wasn't without the, you know, it's probably the first big vote from Britain where you did see quite a lot of digital campaigning. The SNP used, and yes, Scotland did use a lot of uh, kind of, digital online campaigning for the first time and, and probably quite successfully but if you look back that referendum you know the british government really uh, didn't really get that involved there was a thing called better together which was the no campaign which is the conservatives and and labor and it was really headed by labor in scotland and in some ways it wasn't it was it, i think even you know it, it wasn't quite the it hadn't reached that level of partisanship I think we have now. I'm sure lots of people did a bad experience of that referendum for sure, but I think compared to we are now, and I think if you see another Scottish referendum, it'll be on very, very, very different terms than the last one. I think yeah. what you would see is, I think the online campaigning side of it will be off the charts. I think the kind of, you know, the money side of it will be massive. You know, we saw that a bit in the Scottish referendum. There was money coming in from strange sources, both the yes and the no campaigns. There was some, you know, Russia was definitely very interested in the Scottish referendum. There was definitely kind of Russian accounts tweeting around it. But I think what, what you'd see in a, if there was to be a forthcoming referendum on Scottish independence, I think it would be, it'd be a very, very different affair. and actually might be quite more closely aligned to what a border poll might look like. In that I think you would have a kind of pro-UK side, you would see money and, and influence coming in from across the UK, and the UK government would be very involved, which I think is quite difficult, I mean, particularly difficult in Northern Ireland. I think rather than the government of the UK being a kind of slightly, which it was in the Scottish referendum to a point, I think it was fair to say it was. Okay, Occasionally they they'd made big policy announcements like David Cameron's, you know, devolution stuff and um, George Osborne, you won't use sterling. But in general, except for when they felt like they really had to do something, they stood back. I think the British government would be very involved in it if there was a referendum in Scotland. I think they'd be very involved if there was a referendum in Northern Ireland. I think they would want as much as possible to, um, to make sure that the rules for the referendum uh, were written in a, in, in, uh, in a tone that was, uh, that was amenable to them, basically, shall I say. I think they would want it to be you know, I wouldn't be surprised uh, if, yeah, if they were to try and basically, because they would be, the Electoral Commission would set the rules for the referendum, but the Electoral Commission is a very cowed institution. And as I talk about my book, is it's quite small, it's quite under-resourced, it's quite underpowered, has really struggled against this government. This government has said they'd quite like to abolish the Electoral Commission. Um, so they're not really in a great place. And the Electoral Commission was really set up not about referendums, Britain didn't really have referendums, the Electoral Commission was set up, it was really set up to like make to kind of count donations and make sure primarily that elections took place properly. That people, when people went to polling stations, they could vote and it all worked out okay. That was what the Electoral Commission was for. It wasn't for being an arbiter and a referee in a referendum. That wasn't the point of the, the, the exercise. And so it's now going to be put into that position again, uh, almost certainly, I, you know, I think it's quite conceivable there will be both a Scottish referendum and a border poll sooner or later. And I think there's huge potential for online disinformation, you know, and especially in way, you know, this potential we saw at the Rush Report, this potential for state interest and state action uh, around it uh, on all sides, because I think, you know, it's not hard to see how interests like China and Russia could have an interest in, in destabilizing the United Kingdom. But also, it's not hard to imagine where, like, in terms of, of, of trying to influence votes on the ground, where it's, you know, I think it, it, there's huge, huge possibilities, um, especially, and, and Northern Ireland has a checkered history of, of electioneering too. That's what's interesting, for example, is Northern Ireland has its own electoral office, whereas the rest of the UK, it's like councils, but for obvious reasons, that, that was, that's not the case in Northern Ireland since for a long time. And there's a kind of always an awareness that Northern Irish uh, elections uh, can be difficult to police properly as it stands. So no, I think there's a huge, there's a huge concern about that. A lot of academics, there's actually, I'm speaking to them next week, there's a, a study going on at the University College London, looking at the border poll and looking at the mechanics around the border poll and, and issues like this, because there's a real sense that it's, uh, Ireland isn't prepared for, and North and South as well. I think the Republic's 
you know, because if we have a border poll, it's lovely a border poll on both sides of the border, and the Republic is even worse. Uh, Sipo, which was set up, Sipo was basically set up as a, as a kind of holding uh, uh, instrument in the 90s. It would be this thing that would be eventually replaced by a proper standalone electoral commission. That hasn't happened. And spending and donations in, in the Republic are, you know, I occasionally look, look at SIPO donations registers and they're not even worth looking at because nothing is, is registered. It's so easy. It, the loopholes are so massive that everything really can be, can be avoided at registration. So I think on both sides of the board, we saw some stuff around with previous referendums in Ireland around uh, abortion and divorce and uh, abortion and um, uh, gay marriage. But we did see some, yeah, we did see some, uh, some uh, international uh, kind of influence attempts. Those two referendums were so overwhelming that I think it wasn't a massive issue, but it did suggest problems that could come. The Northern Irish side of that border poll will, will almost certainly, no matter what the result be, will be much closer than either of those uh, were at least, or at least it will be until the polling day. So the potential there, and also because these are state issues, they're not about, you know, obviously people like far, you know, people like kind of some, you know, you might get American Christians who are very engaged around abortion, but at a state level, it's not the kind of thing that a state's going to have an influence campaign interest in. Ireland and, and the United Kingdom's kind of internal run workings is a, is a totally different issue. It's of a much higher magnitude in that respect. So one of the things that uh, rebounded on David Cameron, just circling back to the Scottish referendum, was the Project Fear, right? That was the original Project Fear. Um, we've heard about it subsequently. Um, but there was a campaign by, the, by the, go the Cameron's government at that time around the Scottish referendum to raise all kinds of fears, which ultimately was seen to be a successful strategy. And then when they tried to play that card again, um, and they were quite, I, I think, um, uh, almost blasé about it when they were heading into the European referendum, everything was being dismissed as Project Fear. Um, I think we can see some of that emerging already, only in the last week to talk about, again, the cost, you know, if the North was to be uh, reunited with the South, that the South couldn't afford it. Um, there was another, um, Jerry Moriarty reported um, in the Irish Times Saturday before last, I think it was, that you know uh, a certain element, um, loyalist element won't won't accept a result, and you know that the Guardian and the Irish Army certainly weren't geared up to handling um, riots in seventy towns around the north of Ireland. Um, but we can, we I expect we can see a ramping up of this kind of rhetoric, and and back to you know um, some of these think tanks, the the kind of um, and the misinformation and the whole purpose of misinformation really to drive emotion and drive fear um, and to confuse people as to where they can actually get unbiased and objective information. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about, the, you know, the, the um, I suppose, the, the vulnerability and, um, uh, around all of that? I guess it's the, the difficulty, we all see it, you know, it, the difficulty is in, um, you know, we've, social media and, and digital media has, has really changed the game massively, even from 2014 in the Scottish Reform to now. You know, we have just an onslaught of information and it's very, it's increasingly difficult for voters to parse fact from fiction and the kind of, you know, it's, it's very easy to fall into kind of quite tribal echo chambers. We can see it here in Britain where, you know, Boris Johnson, his support hasn't really been dented all that badly despite recent events, despite standing up and saying, you know, he's been able to stand up and say that this treaty, you know, the, the treaty that I signed less than 12 months ago is a terrible thing. And despite being the person who signed it and stood up and stood over it. So I think that's been a big, huge part of it. I think we, you know, that aspect of post-truth post politics. Yeah, so just um, take one or two of the questions that have come in. I have a screen up here as well. Um, so one of the questions that's come in is in terms of sovereignty, democratic values and transparency, Given the alleged scale of dirty money being processed through the UK, has the UK gone past the point of no return? And I think you, you deal with that a little bit towards the end of your book, don't you? Um, I, I know it's a bit of a, a jump now from the potential border poll, but uh, I, uh, that, that was something that you, you addressed in your book, wasn't it, or towards, towards the end? Yeah, I think it is. I think it is. It's, it's, it's going to be interesting to see what happens in Britain in the next while. I do think we have... You know, we've had so many scandals. It's been interesting for me even writing this book and even publishing it. Like in the gap between me finishing this book and it coming out, 
you know, I finished it in January. It was actually originally supposed to come out in May and it came out in August because of the pandemic. We had everything from, you know, Dominic Cummings saying he went off driving to test his eyesight during lockdown, you know, which is basically just taking the public for fools. And the government minister, Michael Gove, who was supposed to be a sensible person, uh, well, depending on what he's written about Northern Ireland at the time as well, has been far from sensible. But he's supposed to be one of the more sane ones coming out and saying, of course I've done that. Who hasn't gone for a drive to test their eyesight for 60 miles? And this is just farcical. We have government contracts. I spent most of the last six months writing about good contracting. We've got government contracts going out left, right and centre to everyone oh, from Tory donors to Dominic Cummings' best friends. We've had funding scandals, Robert Jenrick and the businessman Richard Desmond was a big funding scandal during the summer. Sajiv Javid, the former uh, chancellor, only left office in February. Now he's working for JP Morgan as well as being a, an MP. So we've got this kind of huge amount, I think, and, and almost a, a, an unprecedented deluge of kind of what you can only be called sleaze around the government. Um, and so far it hasn't, uh, to be honest, I think there is a concern that we've, we've kind of got, everything's become so Brexit focused. Um, and I think that's one of the reasons Boris Johnson's gone back to the Brexit issue in the last few weeks is because it's a, bang, it's a drum that he knows he can bang. Um, the question is whether leave and remain become indelible cleavages in British life. You know, do we end up with basically Democrats and Republicans like in America based on the referendum or does something approaching normality start to, to come back after, after uh, you know, after once there comes a point in which you cannot start keep talking about the European Union any longer? Hmm. Um, another question here from Jura Hearn. Dublin-based political and foreign affairs policy think tanks are significantly funded by government departments. Does this funding dependency equal, equally influence policy formation as private donations and lead to there being propaganda platforms for the Irish government policy positioning in those spaces? Um, I don't know how familiar you are with, with um, Dublin institutions, but um, have you any comments on that? I'm not really familiar. I can understand why it's different. I, I do, my understanding is that Ireland's probably a bit small really to make it work for a while if you were looking to influence policy, to be honest, from the size of policy, if you were, if you were uh, a kind of dependent, if you were a corporate organisation, I think in general, to try, and, to try and build that world that doesn't exist in Ireland uh, in terms of right wing. Hello, Peter. I think we may have lost you again. 